Uh, so let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for uh, just a great opportunity to gather together and study the Bible tonight. We pray, God, for everyone that's here tonight, that you'll just bless these families that are represented, that you'll help us, Lord, as we uh, look at your word to, uh, Father, learn a little bit more about who you are, a little bit more about who we are, and how we should relate to you, how we should serve you, and how we should walk with you. Father, I pray, God, that as you help us to go throughout this week and the next week and the weeks to come, Father, that you'll help us to be involved in the idea of sharing the gospel with those we come in contact with, to, to be uh, aware, Lord, that that is our task and responsibility, and then looking for moments that you lead us to, to share with those who are lost, and Father, to be about your business. We also pray, God, that you'll just bless our church. Uh, Father, we thank you for the many folks we've been having uh, that have been visiting our church lately and those that are thinking about joining our church and then those that haven't even visited yet but maybe have been watching online and thinking about coming and seeing us. Father, we pray, God, that you'll just bless our uh, church and use it for your glory and your honor as we seek to reach more and more people. And Father, if there's anyone that doesn't know you as Savior in the room tonight or, or Father, in the building Sunday, we pray, God, that they come to know you uh, before it's too late. Father, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we are going to begin our sermon series on holiness, uh, entitled Holiness, uh, this Sunday. It's, uh, I have been preparing for this sermon series for over a year now, doing some various studies. Uh, it's one of the topics that uh, really excites me the most, uh, the holiness of God and then our holiness, our personal holiness. It excites me the most of any topic in Scripture, and I think it, uh, the holiness of God is really his most important attribute because it, it really encompasses all of his attributes uh, together. So uh, we look forward to beginning that. The sermon this Sunday will be entitled The Holiness of God. So we're going to begin right there at the very beginning and look at what God's holiness is. Uh, so just excited about that. And uh, just invite your friends and your neighbors and your mama and them and everybody. And let's just have a good time as we begin this six-week sermon series. Getting back to our study on the book of Acts, we, as you know, have been examining the activities of the early church um, in an effort to understand as much as possible about the early church in the New Testament after the day of Pentecost and the things that they were doing because they had been commanded by God and were being led by his apostles who were the emissaries of God, the ambassadors of God, the messengers of God, who were delivering the message of God to the people of God, and they were doing things right at the very beginning. Now, there were some issues that popped up, and we'll begin to see those in chapter 6 of the book of Acts, and then as time progresses, we see some other issues pop up uh, when we look at letters like Romans and 1 Corinthians and and 2 Corinthians and Galatians. There are some issues that pop up that the apostles had to deal with. And so uh, we understand that things happen, but this early church was on the right path, and the things that they were doing are things that we should be doing as a church. Now, we talked about the fact that it was the Holy Spirit that was enabling the church to be doing the things that God had called them to do. It was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that caused the church to be who God had called them to be, and it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do what God has called us to do. And sometimes I'm afraid as Baptists, we get hung up a lot on the truth because we're focused on the Word of God, and that's a good place to be. The truth is important, but if we only do the truth and we don't live according to the Spirit, see, Jesus said to the woman at the well, true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. So, so we do need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need to be sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So, so we need to be aware that it's the Holy Spirit that guides us, that empowers us, that enables us, that moves us in the directions that God is calling us to go. And so we noticed a total transformation in the lives of these early believers. They were committed to God in mind and heart and will. And so their lives were being changed. They were, they were one way, and then God made them a new creature. And 
transformed them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Beginning on the day of Pentecost, there was something markedly different about the apostles, something markedly different about the early church because they were no longer functioning under their own power, the power that caused Peter to deny Christ three times. And then just a few days later, would stand up before everyone and preach this sermon that we looked at in chapter 2. So it was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that made all the difference. And so they were totally transformed in their minds and their hearts and their wills. They repented of their sin. God justified them and they committed themselves to a pattern of action that we see in the book of Acts. And we began to talk about this pattern of action over the course of the last few weeks. Uh, We said that they were a church that were committed to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. We also said that the New Testament church was defined by uh, their spiritual activities, their characteristics. A a good church portrays some characteristics. Remember, we said they were an awe-inspiring church, a miraculous church, a sharing church, a joyful church, an attractive church, and a growing church. Did you remember all that? Could you list all those for me before I just called them out tonight? I was just wondering if you were paying attention the last couple of weeks. Now, as we move into chapter 3, we begin to see some very interesting and notable activities in the life of the early church. And then Luke gives us an example here of one of these signs and wonders that takes place through the early church and through the apostles, uh, Peter and John. We know that God confirms his messengers. Uh, In the New Testament, we see this time and again. God confirms his messengers with supernatural acts. God confirms his messengers with miraculous activity. Uh, And these apostles were able to go about and heal people, cast out demons, uh, do all these types of signs and wonders that drew attention to, to not them, but the message that they were delivering. And so we would not know who the true messengers or deliverers of God's message were, or the true gospel message, had it not been for the accompaniment of miraculous activity among the early church and the apostles in particular. And so the uh, apostles performed miracles that authenticated the message that they were delivering. All right, y'all tracking with me on that, right? Y'all follow me? Because y'all, y'all look a little bit tired and, and a little bit zoned out. All right, so we want to inspire some all with the word of God, okay? I know it's been a long day. It's been a long day for all of us. So why is this important? Why is it important that their message was authenticated by miracles? Because we now follow the exact same message today. The message of the gospel has endured hundreds of and thousands of years to come to us today because it was delivered authoritatively through the apostles and confirmed by these signs. So let's look at this miracle in chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, we'll read verse 1 to 10. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The astounding miracle 
gathered a curious crowd, and that prepares them to hear the gospel. They are going to hear the gospel momentarily. Now, we'll look at that next week. But it also served to confirm that Peter and John were worth listening to. These people have some authority because look what they can do. They can take this man that you all know, that you all recognize, that you've all seen, that you've probably all given some money to. They take this man and now he's walking and leaping and praising God. So let's look at the situation. You remember the song I sang about this particular miracle, right? You remember it? Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. Y'all remember that? It's the one we heard when we were kids in school, uh, in, in Sunday school, and apparently nobody knew it around these parts. It must be a Mississippi thing. And Peter and John were going to the temple. Why do you think Peter and John were going to the temple? Because that's what Peter and John did. They went to the temple at the hour of prayer, and they were going there to share the gospel. That's what they were doing. They were going to share the gospel. And Peter and John, we notice, were frequently together in Scripture. Why are Peter and John so often together in Scripture? Well, first of all, they were partners in the fishing business long before Jesus ever came along. They knew each other. They were buddies. They we also find out they prepared the Passover for Jesus. They were the ones that came together to do that. Who were the two that ran to the tomb to see that it was empty? Peter and John, right? They were always together. And we also see later on in the book of Acts, it is Peter and John who go to minister to the Samaritans that believed in Christ. So these guys were not just partners. It seems like they were pretty close friends. Now, there they were going to the temple. Now, at one point, these guys were competing for greatness. You remember, they were trying to figure out which one would sit at the right hand of the throne of God, uh, the throne of Jesus when he came into his kingdom. They were fighting over these things, right? But now they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And remember, they were completely transformed and they were cooperating together for the purpose of building the church. And so they frequently went to the temple together to pray. Now they were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, which is the ninth hour. Now what time of day would be the ninth hour? Now we would think it would be nine o'clock. But they start counting their days from the, their hours from the time the sun came up. Right? Because the time the sun came up would be when you go to work. And when you get done with work, you go to the hour of prayer. So at the ninth hour, it would be about 3 o'clock our time since the sun comes up around 6. So about 3 o'clock in the afternoon was the hour of prayer at the temple, and Peter and John were going to the temple at around 3 o'clock. This was the time of the evening sacrifice, the ninth hour. That was the time of the evening sacrifice, and was the busiest time at the temple. So if you were going to share the gospel at the temple, with Jews who were looking for the Messiah, if you were going to tell them about the coming Messiah, you would want to go at the busiest part of the day, would you not? And so that's when they were going. They were going to pray. Um, on the way, they encountered a man who was crippled from birth. Now, he had been carried each day to the place where he begged for money, and that's how he made his living, by begging for money. Now, the Templar, the temple was a popular tem temple and popular. I tried to say them together. The temple is a popular place for beggars to go. Why? Well, people would pass by you every day on a daily basis. And people who were going to worship in the temple were usually in a good frame of mind. And also, giving of alms to the poor was part of the Jewish custom of worship. And so, they had to give their alms to somebody and so there needed to be somebody there for them to give it to. And it worked out. So it was actually a great place. So they placed this lame man strategically at a place at the beautiful gate for maximum effect. And it was the gate that, that Peter and John were walking in. He spotted them and he calls out to them asking for alms. Now I want you to see something here. The sovereignty of God is at work in this story. You say, well, this is just a guy. They walked by and they healed him. No, no. 
There's no accidents with God. Everything is, is, works out according to his plan and his will. This man was sitting at that gate, at that time, at that place, at the time that God directed Peter and J John to go to the temple. And so it was not an accident that they happened upon this man. It was a sovereign, divine appointment of God. Well, how do you know? Well, there's nine gates. They could have sent him by one of the other eight. This is the guy. This is the man to be healed. The one everybody recognized as having been there for many years. Warren Wiersbe notes that part of the miracle was that God led Peter and John to this man at this time and they were sensitive to the leading of the Spirit to see the man that God was calling them to heal in that moment. There would have been thousands of people all around the temple. And likely there were many, many other beggars, scores of beggars. But God was confirming the apostles and their message from the healing of this man at this time, at this place. Part of any miracle that God does is being where God calls you to be at the time he calls you to be there. You see, there's a lot of things that go into the work of God's plan. It's not an accident. Everything has to work according to a strategic plan, see. And so all these things come together, and they may appear to be coincidences to us, but they are not. God is working. Now, this beggar was expecting to receive a little mercy in the form of a little money. But he didn't realize that he was about to receive a greater mercy, healing, and then salvation. So let's look at the sign. It says here in verse 4, and Peter directed his gaze at him. So he calls out, he's Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He stuck out his palm and asked for an um, and this is what Peter did say. There's the song again, right? Now, what the song doesn't say is Peter said, look at us. Stop what you're doing. Don't worry about anybody else passing by. You look at me right now. Because I'm about to give you something far greater than you could ever imagine. Verse 5, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. So look at us, he said. Peter must have instantly crushed this man's spirit when he says, I don't have any silver or gold. I got nothing. But then when he took him by his hand, he went from a crushed spirit to exuberant praise. I don't have silver or gold. I have something much better. Get up. You won't have to be carried anymore. Get up. This miracle displays four characteristics that are worth noting. Number one, it was unexpected. When the... Uh, Apostles fixed their gaze on the beggar and commanded him to look at them. He expected to receive money. They had no money. They had something greatly more valuable. The beggar must have wondered, what can be more valuable than money? I mean, a man's got to eat. What can be more valuable than money? Probably several other beggars like this man around the city, some even crippled, but the Lord chose to heal this man. And he received something unexpected, healing, but then he received something far greater than he ever dreamed. 
relationship with God. So it was unexpected. Secondly, it was done in the name of Jesus Christ. The man must have been perplexed at the mention of the name of Jesus Christ. You know, think about him processing all this information. I don't have silver or gold, but I do have something for you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Wait a minute. The guy they murdered on the tree? You know, I remember hearing about all that. And I remember they released Barabbas and they took him to the tree. That guy, is that the guy you're talking about? And perhaps this man had not yet benefited at all from Jesus' ministry. And yet they were going to heal him in the name of Jesus. Now, I do want to say one thing about the name of Jesus because it's kind of become this mantra in the charismatic movement to do this and that in the name of Jesus Christ. It's important that we know that whenever you are doing something in the name of Jesus Christ, it is under his authority, but you can only do something in the name of Jesus Christ that is in direct alignment with his will. There's a strong difference between using Jesus' name as some kind of good luck charm and some kind of talisman to do something or some kind of token gimmick to do something and then understanding that God is about to do something and praying in, under the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, asking him to do something rather than claiming he'll do something just because you mentioned his name. They were acting under the authority of Jesus, and Jesus had delegated the apostles with his power through the gift of healing. And they had the gift of healing, and they were using it right then and there. And in the name of Jesus Christ, they commanded this man to rise up and walk. And they were in tune with the will of God. The Lord led them to that place. The Lord led Peter to look at this man and say, look at us. And the Lord led him to say, get up and walk. And the Lord led him to reach down and grab him by the hand and pick him up to walk. And notice that, thirdly, it was instantaneous. Now, some of you have had knee or hip replacements. And recuperation takes a while. But think of the atrophy that occurs in a person who is lame from birth. And yet, he was healed instantly. The strength returned to his legs instantly. Reminds me of a story. There was a, this man that came up to one of those faith healers. They were having this big tent revival and there was this faith healer out there. And he got in line to be prayed for and he got up to the platform and the guy brought him up on stage and said, what do you want me to pray for? He said, my hearing. He said, your hearing? Yeah. So he grabbed him by the head and started praying and shaking his head around and prayed for him to receive his hearing again and, and for his ears to be unstopped and all this stuff. And he took his hands off and he said, how's your hearing? He said, I don't know. It's next Thursday. <laughs> um, I, don't, I just thought of that right now. I remember that from a while back. But the healing of Jesus is instantaneous. The healing in the name of Jesus is instantaneous. It happens. You know, when he raises somebody from the dead, they were dead. Now they're, they're not dead. When he, when he gives them back their, their ability to walk, they can't walk and then they can walk. And they're blind and now they can see. We're dead spiritually, and now we're alive spiritually. That's the miracle of Jesus Christ. So it was instantaneous. And notice lastly that it was complete. As soon as the beggar felt strength in his legs, he didn't just start walking. He was walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He was leaping. 
You know? Skip, I bet you're about ready to start running and leaping, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Instantaneous healing. So unbelievable that this man couldn't resist the opportunity to skip through the temple like a little school child. I mean, picture that. And think of the spectacle. Look at that guy in the tattered rags. He was just sitting out there by the temple for the last 20 years. These four characteristics provide a miracle checklist to screen alleged miraculous activity. What are they? It's unexpected. The doctor said, we don't know what happened. The tumor was there one minute, now it's gone the next. It must be prayed for in the name of Jesus Christ. It's instantaneous. <laughs> well, it was there when we did the scan yesterday, now it's gone. And it's complete healing. This is a healing that fits the true biblical pattern and it stems from God's choice, sovereign choice. And it will be done in such a way that it is to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. What happened? What was the response? Look back at verses 8, 8 and 10, 8 to 10. And when the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he, and look at verse 11, and while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. Oh, look at all these people gathered around. It's time for a sermon. So see, it was done in a way that glorified God. What were the results of this miracle? Four, uh, not four, these are mentioned. First, joy. The beggar expressed great joy over his healing. He showed joy through praise. The ritual of the evening sacrifice was interrupted by cries of excitement and joy at what God had done for him. There was genuine worship and praise from this man. Worship, true worship is genuine that comes from the heart. Just being at a church service does not constitute true worship. Just singing half a worship song does not constitute true worship. True worship is when our heart's devotion and our mind's attention are focused on God. And notice I said heart's devotion. It's not just emotion. It's not just uh, uh, going through the motions. It's not just emotion. It's not just uh, ritual or ceremony. True worship is when we're devoted to the Lord and what we're singing and what we're saying and how we're living, worship is all of that, is focused on the Lord. And so there was joy, there was praise, and then thirdly, there was witness. The beggar's healing caused a scene. And immediately the folks were gathered together because they recognized this as the beggar that was by the gate. And so this miracle was a witness and a testimony to the Lord and his messengers and the message that they had been delivering and were about to deliver again. And the miracle prepared a way for a sermon that was preached by Peter in the next several verses. So what does all this mean for us today? Well, it means, first, that God has confirmed the message that we now preach through miraculous works. We are not fearful that the gospel message is the wrong message. We have the truth. God gave it to us, and he confirmed his messengers through which he passed it down. Second, 
God is still doing miraculous things today. One of the most important miraculous things that God does is salvation. Like this man's healing, salvation is unexpected. I've heard many stories about folks who are saved at this particular meeting or that particular meeting or when they encounter this particular person, and they weren't expecting to be saved that day. They weren't even looking for it. And when we recognize who we are, sinners before a holy God, salvation truly is unexpected. Why would God want to save us? Salvation is performed in the name of Jesus Christ as well. It's only through his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is instantaneous. Once we were lost, now we're saved. Once we were dead, now we're alive. And salvation is complete. When God saves you, he saves you to the uttermost. Y'all ever heard that song? Saved to the uttermost, I know that I am. Saved to the uttermost. That just means there, there, there ain't any more. You can't get saved any more than Jesus already saved you. So here's a question. We have been healed in a sense, correct? We were dead, now we're alive. We were lost, now we're found. We were in the kingdom of darkness, now we're in the kingdom of light. We have been saved. Are we joyful? Are we praising? And do we witness? We should pray for miracles. We should pray for them regularly. And I think we do. And when we see a miracle, we should have the same response. And when we see the miracle of someone saved, we should have the same response. And I'm not suggesting that everyone, when we see a miracle, should be running and leaping and praising God. But you ought to be doing it in your hearts. If everybody started getting up, jumping around, I'd be afraid, you know, y'all might. Yes. That's what I was thinking. I wasn't going to say it out loud, but I'd be worried somebody might, you know, might have to, we might have to see another miracle, is all I'm saying. But we do need to feel that way in our heart, walking and leaping and praising God. I think about this story, and this, this story is one of those stories in Scripture that just makes me happy. You know, think about it from this guy's perspective. Spent his entire life lame. To be used in that moment by the God of the universe to draw attention and bring other souls to his kingdom. It reminds me of, uh, I think it's John chapter 9 where the blind man is healed. And Jesus says, uh, he's walking along with his disciples and they say, Jesus, what, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born, you know, blind. He was blind. And Jesus said, no one. He was born blind so at this moment he could glorify the Son and glorify the Father in heaven. And then he healed him. When his whole life blind to be used by God and we're still talking about him today. We don't have his name. But I can guarantee you, when we get to heaven, you're going to find a guy still running and leaping and praising God. And you're going to go, hey, don't I know you? And he'll say, yeah. Yeah, you've read about me. And we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you for this night. We pray, God, that you'll go with us now as we leave this place. Use us for your glory in all that we do. And help us, Lord, to be miracle workers as we seek to see others saved through the message of the gospel so that we can, too, join with people in their excitement about coming into the kingdom. And Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.